a fastball, right? I'm hunting the heater. So if I go up there and there's somebody on base that's super fast, they're going to throw me a fastball because they know if I throw a breaking ball, this guy's stealing second and they don't want that to happen either. So I'm a better hitter if I'm a power guy when you being a fast guy gets on base. But if you try to be a power guy when you're hitting and you're not, and you just fly out and fly out, then we never get people on base so that our other teammates can be more effective. So what you got to look at is in order to actually be a wolf pack and defeat the Buffalo, you got to figure out what your role is within that team. And then you got to be really, really good at that. You don't have to be the best everything on your team, but whatever that role is, you want to maximize that and be the best at that. And it's really, really cool when you start to understand that as a player, because one of the things it does is it takes the pressure off of you as an individual to try to do it all. There's no pressure to do absolutely everything because there's no expectation that you can do that. Okay. We have guys on our team at the high school level who we consider kind of like glue guys, right? So they just keep everybody together. They can do a little bit of everything. True story. We're in a game last year. It goes 17 innings. So we're in a 17 inning conference game, um, heated matchup. And we bring in this, this glue guy for us late in the game. Well, he's a good contact hitter, but he's not real fast average defender. Um, but he does everything the exact way that we taught it. He's just a, a master at the details. So he's leading off top of the 16th. He strikes out. Well, catcher drops the ball. This kid strikes out. He takes off down the baseline. He gets through the bag, catcher overthrows first. Perfect breakdown, looks over his right shoulder, sees the ball without any coaching, takes second. So now we lead off with a strikeout in the 16th, and we're standing on second base because – Rather than pouting and being upset that he didn't get the big hit, he's okay being on second knowing he did everything right, even though he struck out. Okay, guess what? We win that game two hitters later when a big bopper comes up and hits a sack fly because our guy before him sack bunted into third. Okay, so that was the play of the game. We won because our guy struck out and he didn't quit as soon as he did that. So for you guys, you have to understand everybody wants to be like the main guy. We all have a little bit of pride. And when you play video games with baseball guys, like you want a bunch of big guys and like the star players, but the star players can't shine if the rest of us don't do our role effectively. Then they just go, you know, two for three, but the team doesn't win. So you got to figure out what that role is. And it's okay if you don't like that. Okay. Because you have practice to go improve that and change that role. But when games roll around, whatever that coach says, whatever that lineup says for you, for you, if it says like, hey, you're not in the starting lineup and coach says you're going to be my first courtesy runner, then you be the best courtesy runner that you can be, right? You go out there and you steal bases because there are guys that really that's their role, right? Terrence Gore, professional player. He's got a World Series ring and he had like three at bats that entire season for the Kansas City Royals. He's just super fast. So they'd get on, he'd pinch run, he'd steal two bags, and he was on a World Series team, right? He's a World Series champion just as a runner. So once you start to, to figure out that framework, honestly, limits go away as soon as you know what your role is because you can maximize exactly what that is. So you're limitless within that role, okay? The last thing I'll say about it, when you look at this idea of like having a role and being a team and falling in line with whatever that is, um, for you, it's important to understand what you're really good at. And it's also important to understand what you're, what you're not so good at. Um, and those are areas you can practice, but it's also really good when you realize that because it opens you up when we, like we talked about yesterday, living out of love, right? When, when you feel com confident and comfortable with your team, then it gives you the opportunity to listen to and learn from and learn with other players. Cause you can go up to a buddy and say, Hey, I really, I'm a great fielder, except for my backhand. Like, how do you do this? How do you approach that ball? What's your mindset? What's your framework? And when you guys start learning from each other, that's, that's when progress is really made. We can teach you a little bit, but as soon as you guys start to be open to learning from each other as teammates, then everybody's development just shoots through the roof. Yeah, you're so spot on, man. We love each other. Love is the greatest emotion in the world. And when we're younger, it's kind of cheesy when we hear love, like love, oh, love, I don't want to love. I like you. I like your girls have cooties or you have cooties, right? Like a lot of that stuff happens. 
Um, and I even I joke around with my sister with that. She's 14. She's a freshman in high school, and, and she's going through the whole stages of high school. And for you high schoolers in here, it's it's crazy nowadays. You guys are dealing with a lot. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things that can get in our way. Get in our way. In our vision. But guess what? Like The more that we can focus on what we can control and what's right in front of us and the ways that we can get better, the better we're going to be and support our teammates. So if we lead out of love, which means leading with my heart, like anything I feel in my heart is real. That's what's real. Anything up here is just our thoughts, but anything in here is real. Like this is how I feel about my teammates. Like I love my teammates. When I was your age in little league at 11, 12 years old, I loved my teammates. They were amazing. I was on the Rangers. It was incredible. When I was in travel ball, 13, 14, 15, Loved my teammates. I loved going to Cooperstown. I loved going to these cool tournaments in California. It was awesome. In high school, same thing. Love my teammates. I still talk to every senior on my team, all 10 of them. College, professional level, it doesn't matter where we go. Baseball teaches us a lot. Ronnie, what do you got on this subject? Yeah, so I don't know about you guys, uh, coaches, but roles also change, whether it's game to game, year to year, development happens, like it changes. And, and a good example of that, like I use myself a lot in this. When I was in high school, I batted fifth. I mean, I was an RBI guy right in the middle of the order, time to score some runs, get guys in. Um, my best friend growing up was our four hitter, and, and our role was was literally let's just score as many runs as we can. When I got to college, I was shell-shocked a little bit. My coach was like, you're going to play every day. If you're going to bat ninth, and I need you to get on base because we got a really stacked lineup. We got guys who are going to play at the next level, and, and we need to make sure that you're on base to, to help get, get more runs in for our team. My role completely changed. And I want you guys to understand that your role right now is the most important role for our team, but it doesn't define you. It doesn't define who you are or what you're going to become as a player. They change. You know, I, I remember uh, a, a kid, couple kids I played with, like one year they were yeah. six foot, 155 pounds. Then the next year they were six foot one, 200 pounds. They become a different player. Instead of being that singles guy that's just going to get on base, they become a, pow a power guy, a guy dropping some bombs, right? So for you guys, understand that your roles don't define you and they can change based on the team that you're on, based on that specific game. You know, and the one thing that, that I learned was, you know, we need to be all around baseball players because you never know what role you're going to have in late innings or late games or important games, championship games, things like that. I'll never forget in the biggest game I ever played in my life, our four hitter bunted sacrifice bunting the guy over to second base we won the game because of it if our four if our four hitter was only in there just to hit home runs we might not have won a championship so understand that if you the more all around you are the more roles you can play you know the more things that you can do for your team and that's ultimately what the goal is is, is create an environment for yourself where you're able to do more right so be as be as well-rounded as you can be able to bunt hit and run move runners sack fly hit the ball on the ground hit the ball in the air like those are huge right and I and I learned that personally because I went from being a power guy try to hit doubles and home runs to being a, a hit by pitch walk singles guy right so that's that's probably the biggest thing I got is to be as well-rounded as you can but understand that your role doesn't define you yeah Ronnie I want to add something onto that man like I one I love the identity piece we could talk about identity for years because I get fired up when I hear about identity like it's my favorite thing to talk about because it's your internal temperature like it's your thermostat. Like where am I setting my temperature at? Am I setting it um, at 95 at 100 where I'm rocking and rolling every day? Or is my temperature below freezing and now I'm walking around frigid and I'm cold and, and I'm, I'm scared to make mistakes and I'm timid and, and I don't play with my the best of my ability. Um, I want to hit on something in the chat that Jacob said. Jacob Wycliffe. I don't know if you have video on here or not. I couldn't find it. Wherever you are, however old you are, this fired me up. He said, the disease of me equals the defeat of us. <laughs> hashtag wisdom nugget of the day you're taking the mic next time you're leading this podcast i don't even know what it's the school podcast whatever you want to call it you're leading it from now on literally the disease of me i wrote it down like you can learn from anybody right like the disease of me leads to the defeat of us if we get so selfish where it's all about me 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 and that's all i care about our team's going to suffer our coaches are going to suffer our friends our family our parents are going to suffer but if we think about us, what can I do to make us better? What can I do to make Ronnie better? What can I do to make Jake better? Not only in his business, but in his life, at home with his kids, with his family, in his business. If we think about what we can do for each other, that's love. That's acting out of love like Jake was talking about. So, Ronnie, great, great point. Just want to hit on that to add on to your roles. Like I wrote down, your role does not define you. You know, like it can always change. Adam, what do you got to add on to this, man? 
Well, I'll add on to that um, that idea that Wycliffe was talking about, and that's something the disease of me and the defeat of us is something we talk about in BAM a lot. And a big portion of that is when you're unhappy with that role that that coach puts you in, if you have that paranoia of being cheated out of what you think is yours, then you're not accepting that role that that coach has put in you. You have to instill some trust in the coach that all of the development and all of the practice you guys have put in is that they have defined what, or they have recognized in you what role they feel like you should have in that system. We want you to accept that role because you got to understand that your place within a system is your job. That job that you have is what that coach believes is going to allow you guys or allow you individually to do the best for your team as you possibly can. So there's a reason to accept it because that's the way that the system works and that's how we're going to be most successful overall. But there's a difference in accepting it, I think, and being satisfied within that role. Like we may put you in a spot that you're not necessarily happy about. You might have felt as if you had put in the work or put in the effort or you were better than another guy. But if we didn't put you there, again, that's not a control that uh, something that you can control. You can't control what we put on the lineup at the end of the day. You can control whether or not you're satisfied of it and whether or not you want to go out there and try to take on something uh, that you did that you didn't get. So you just have to recognize that it's something that you've earned. I mean, uh, Byler talked about that Dodgers coach uh, at the beginning of the thing. He said that he coached all the way down to the high school level. And now he's all the way up to the pro level. Like if he was just satisfied with where he was at, he would not have continued to progress from there. So it's accepting your role because that's what you've earned at that time and doing your best as a teammate within that to not let that disease of you and focusing on the individual accomplishments to outshine the overall group accomplishments and making sure you're doing your job that you've been, that you've been given and that you've earned, but don't be satisfied within that. And that's okay. We don't want you to sit there and pout about it. We want you to go on your own and do those things outside of the team to make sure that you can go try to make that guy that's ahead of you a little bit better. And if you are that starter right now, don't be satisfied in that either. Understand that there's probably somebody that you don't even know that's uh, putting in all this kind of work outside just to try to take your spot. Don't be satisfied wherever you're at, whether that's a bench player or whether or not it's a starter. Like don't have that resentment or confidence of other people work together to try to go work for that overall goal. And that's why you have that spot and, and why you have that role within that system. That's why coaches put you there. Adam, that's awesome. You need to touch on why us as coaches put you there. I think we gave good insight on, the, the meaning behind the roles, but you, you really touched well right there on, hey, why is, like, as a coach, like, maybe we're just putting you in a role to succeed, or maybe we're putting you somewhere where you can't control, but guess what? How do you stay satisfied? How do you accept the role that you're given and take pride in it? Like, how do I take pride? Like, taking pride means I really cherish that role. Like, I'm going to do everything I can for my teammates. We've already talked about the disease of we, and um, Jake said that that's what they, it's the first thing they learn at BAM. Like, to, to just say what you guys are doing there at each one of your facilities in your programs with hot corner with bam like it's unbelievable how lucky these athletes are like i wish that we had something like this when i was younger we had great coaching but we didn't have the intimacy the love the affection the the cherishment like the the ability to speak our mind and to learn the side of the game at that age like i wish i had a zoom call where i can pop on with ex-pros ex-college athletes current coaches at high levels current guys who are working with pros right now like it's incredible people who can provide some um, but something i want to i want to touch on was um i wrote down from what you said adam is lions are chasing you and what i mean by that is we're not just competing against other athletes in america puerto rico those dudes are hitting freaking bottle caps with a stick I've got two buddies in the Diamondbacks organization that on Twitter last year, and these are dudes that are in professional baseball, like at the highest level, right? They're in the middle of the street with no shoes on, with a bottle cap and a stick playing baseball with it. Like what? We are privileged enough, except for right now, but we're usually privileged enough to go out to our field and to go play with our really sweet swaggy Wilson glove and my A2000 and my awesome D Marini bat and go drop bombs on my local field that has a fence. Like these dudes are in the middle of the street with traffic, with crazy people all around that are hitting bottle caps, getting better. And uh, I just wanted to touch on that. Like, what are some things that we can do guys? Uh, and Jake, we can start back with you is like, what are some things for these athletes that they can use, like some tools that they can use to accept their role in the face of adversity, in the face of fear, in the face of not, 
enjoying the hand or the cards that are dealt to them, if that makes yeah. sense. And I think it all comes back to a little bit of what Ronnie talks about with identity. Um, and the moment as a player that you understand a couple of things, one, all coaches want to win, right? So they're not going to put you in a role that they don't think is right because they just don't like you, right? I, it doesn't matter if I like my players or not. I'm going to put them in a position that we get to win games. That's the goal. So coaches are doing their best to put you in that spot. Okay. But you got to look at it from life too. Okay. So your value as a player, as a person in general, it's, it's really not correlated to whatever your role is on the team. Okay. So where you guys get in trouble a lot as players is you take your value solely by your performance. And as soon as we can separate that, then it's easier to accept a role because we understand that it doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change what my life looks like and where I'm going to go or anything like that. Right. All of us as coaches in here have some type of job and we didn't just start where we are now leading 187 kids in this. So we had to climb whatever company ladder that was or create our own companies and do that. And you got to look at your role the same way, right? Day one, it might not be what you want, but neither will your profession, neither will your job or where you're going in life. You got to grow and you got to build and you have to have that vision, know where you're going, but also take the steps along the way to get there. So once you decide that you're going to do that, one of the big things that, that we always have players struggle with that um, I do want to bring up is a lot of times you guys choose to be bad at a role because you're hoping that if you show the coach that you're not good at that, they give you something different that you might like. For instance, I give a bunt sign and you miss it on purpose. Strike one. I give a bunt sign. You pull back. Strike two. Guess what? I'm still giving you a bunt sign, even though you're down 0-2 because you have a job and you're going to complete your task. But a lot of you guys think, well, if I miss it twice, they're going to let me swing because they're not going to let me strike out bunting. So we go through this two-strike approach, right? We don't adjust because we want to hit a bomb, even though it's not what the team needs. So understanding how to adjust and when to adjust and do those things is, is really, really big. Um, I think when you talk about some of the adversity that you see as a player um, and as a team as you go through, like, the course of a season and all of that, um, the biggest thing is that you – have some process that you've developed in regards to pregame and postgame to leave whatever happened on the field there, right? And then the next day is a new day. It's another opportunity to play. If you were four for four with four bombs, that's great, but it doesn't mean you're going to be successful the next day. If you were 0 for four, that doesn't mean you're going to be successful the next day either. Um, does also doesn't mean you're going to fail the next day. So you have to be able to separate all of those things. Um, and that's a huge, a huge step for a, an athlete to go from, good to great is your bounce back ability, right? How do you overcome the day before? How do you go in with a fresh slate, a new mind um, to actually go in and understand, hey, I was 0 for 4. Maybe my role for this next game is going to look different. But whatever that is, how do I maximize that? Like, how do I be a good teammate and help those guys? Okay, we had a player last year. He was a senior, and he chose to go on spring break right before our season started. And instead of him starting game one in center field like he thought he would, we had a junior that was starting over him. Well, this junior goes out, and he goes three for four, gets a sack bunt down, makes a great play in the outfield. He earned a spot. But he's going to keep starting. The senior quit two weeks later saying that it wasn't fair. Right? It wasn't fair that he didn't, he didn't play. He didn't start. He's a senior. He's earned it, right? You don't earn anything by age, guys. You earn something by consistent hard work daily every single day. Okay, J.J. Watt is one of the, the best quotes in regards to success. He said, success is leased and not owned, and rent is due every day. So every day you wake up and you have to make the decision to be successful today. And what overall, like, success in the future looks like is you doing that one day after another after another, and it's the sum of all those days put together that makes you have sustainable success. But just because you were really good one game or one day doesn't mean that the rest of your life will be successful either. Right. And I think we struggle with that because we do something great. I still have players that tell me about how good they were when they were 10. Right? It doesn't matter. Nobody cares anymore. Show me what you're going to do today. Right. And that's what every coach wants to see. So if I had to give you one wisdom, nugget, it's this. I've heard from so many players um, that are struggling with that idea of adversity. They say, you know, I just wish my coach would put me in the position because like if he just puts me there, I'll show him what I can do. You got to flip that right? You got to show the coach what you can do in practice. That's what practice is for. 
as a coach, I would tell you, show me what you can do, and then I'll put you in that spot. Not, let me give you a chance and see what you can do. Now, I'm not, we don't want to play the game of what if, right? We want to know what we have consistently coming into a game. So your guys' time, your guys' opportunity to do that is practice, is your lessons, your individual training, all of that. You got to earn that there so that we don't have a choice but to put you in the lineup, right? Force our hand, make it tough on us. Um, one of my favorite teams was when I had 16 kids and all of them could have started. And it was so hard to put a lineup together because they were all forcing our hand as a staff to make decisions on who wasn't going to play. All right, it's a great problem to have as a coach. And it's your guys' job to put us in that position. Yeah, that's big time, man. Like just empowering the athlete. At the end of the day, no matter how good our talent is. Yeah, that's true. No matter how um, – one sec. So cool. Hang on. Okay, we had to remove them. Um, <laughs> yeah, they might have a Zoom bomber coming in. I might not be. Cool. <laughs> um, I think that at the end of the day, right, Jake? Like, it's it's huge to understand like that we are in control of our career. We are in control of what is in front of us as athletes. And that's like the biggest thing that you just touched on, man, is like you control your destiny, man. You control yep. if you get in the lineup or not for the most part. You may not be able to control if the coach puts you in there, but you control how hard you work yep. to get in there. And no matter what age you're at, no matter how old you are, um, if you continue to work hard, if you continue to push forward every single day and find a place that you get better at, you're going to get better and you're going to improve. And you're going to see those improvements. And, and I like to just give this description of like a lot of the times – people think success is like get 1% better. Some of you younger guys have maybe never heard of this, but some of you who have either been in our, our program or have, have been around for a little bit, you've heard get 1% better. How do I get 1% better? Well, guess what? Sometimes getting 1% better doesn't mean we're going strictly uphill, right? Sometimes we're getting knocked down, pushed around. We go 0 for 4, we go 0 for 6, we get crushed and something happens to us. We go through adversity and something like that happens to us to where we get – knocked down and we got to learn how to bounce back and get back up and handle an 0 for 4 and handle a, a, a three run outing in two innings and we get pulled from the game because our coach is mad at us like how do we handle these things so I post in the chat how do you handle adversity I'm getting a lot of great messages privately that's really firing me up of different things we can do not worrying about the things we can't control reading focusing on things we love to do um, continue to support our teammates there's a lot of good stuff happening um, Ronnie go ahead man yeah, so I got two things on that. Uh, the I've seen this a thousand times on social media, but the the ladder of success is definitely not straight. It's a roller coaster ride. You're gonna hit peaks. You're gonna hit valleys. And and the the people that get through it are the ones that never quit. That's so the one thing I learned about myself is is the day I, that I wanted to quit doing something, that's when I needed to stop completely and move on to something that I cared more about. Baseball, baseball is the greatest game in the entire world for me. So I don't care how good or bad it is on that specific day. Guess what? I'm going to keep pushing through. I'm going to keep grinding because I know that there's just more on the other side. Some days are better than others. You know, some days you go 0 for 4 in a big game. Some days you go 4 for 4 in a game that doesn't matter. You know, but, but those are the days that you get better, right? It's peaks and valleys. Um, and the second thing is, is my coach, he used to say this all the time. And it was the, probably the greatest, greatest quote I've ever gotten was, he said to us every year on day one, I don't create the lineup. I don't do it. You guys do. And what you do in practice every single day is, is how I set the lineup. The lineup is the easiest thing in the entire world for a coach because those guys have earned it, right? And so for you guys that are listening in right now, understand that. Coaches never make the lineup. You do. And your preparation weekly and your preparation monthly and through the whole offseason, that goes a long way. What you do in October, that actually matters in March. You know, for especially for our Northeast guys, because we're indoors, right? The training that you guys are doing in the weight room, the training that you guys are doing to make your defense better and your hitting better, like that, all of that stuff we see as coaches. And so when we're setting the lineup, it's like, you know what? I don't know who I'm going to put in this nine hole, but this guy did a really nice job all winter long. I'm going to give him a shot because you earned it. And I think that that's the biggest thing is I want you guys to understand that it's a very easy to set a lineup when I've got nine guys, 10 guys that have earned their keep, right? And so that, that's really what I got. I think you guys touched everything, but you earn your spot in the lineup. We don't create it for you. Yeah, continue to earn it, continue to earn it, continue to earn it. Do what you can to be successful um, and, and continue to push forward, continue to grow in every single aspect of your game. Uh, Adam, what do you got for us, man? 
Uh, well, you guys, I had adverse, the word adversity written down before today. Like I went out last night after we talked and went out on a run to kind of reflect on everything. And one of the things that kept coming to my mind was adversity and how we were going to talk about with that today within the roles. And another A word that I love that you guys are going to hear us talk about a ton during these next four weeks is the word approach. Like we all know that adversities are going to happen. If you're going into baseball or into life, being surprised when tough times come, then you don't have the approach that you need when those things come. Like I work out a lot and it's not to try to necessarily look good for my wife. If I do, if I do look good for my wife, that's a bonus, but it's so that I can face those hard times as well as I can when those things come. So when you go over four, don't be surprised. When you have a bad day on the mound, don't be surprised. Same thing with an error, just same thing with a, a bad day overall. You have to have an approach in your mind of how you're going to handle those things when they come. And we're going to talk about a lot of different tools as far as giving you guys ideas of how to approach those things. But understand that we said it yesterday, if, if even if you're the best in the world, you're failing 70% of the time at this game, right? And you're going to have slumps. You're going to have two or three bad weeks in a row that might take you out of that starting spot that you earned and that role that you had at the beginning of the year. But just like Ronnie said at the beginning, things change. And when those things change, we, we often don't expect them, but you have to expect them and you have to have an approach uh, in order to do those things. I, uh, there's this book that I love. I've read a few times. It's called The 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. It's one of my favorite books that I've mm -hmm. ever read. Great book. It talks about uh, raising children and whether or not you're going to overprotect your children or prepare them for the hard times. So you can protect them from the snakes in the grass or make them aware that the snakes in the grass are going to come and you can help them battle those things by having an approach and understanding that when those bad times come, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be surprised and run away from them when those problems come? Or are you going to be prepared to take those things on? So your starting spot's going to get taken by somebody that's worked really hard. You're going to have slumps. You're going to have uh, bad weeks. You're going to have bad days where you maybe treat somebody badly. But what's your approach when those bad times come? Are you going to be surprised or are you going to be ready to take them on? And that's a big thing we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. Yeah, I think we should dive into that a little bit today, man, about your approach. Like there was um, just talking about it. We all have a, a pregame approach or like a pre at bat approach for the most part. Some of us maybe don't know what that is. Maybe we can help develop that. But what I mean by that is when I go up to the plate, what am I looking for? Like, what is my approach? So for me as a hitter, I was a left handed hitter, power hitter. So if I was able to get a ball middle away, a fastball middle away, that's what I'm looking for. A fastball middle away. I know I can hit a home run to center field. But if you throw a fastball inside, sauce job, my bat's getting broken and I'm mad and I'm throwing my, my helmet somewhere. I'm not having a good at bat. But if I swing at my pitch in my zone on my timing, I'm going to be successful or at least give myself the best chance to succeed. But we talk about a lot about the pre at bat or pre game approach or my pre step in the field. But we don't talk a lot about a failure plan. Like what's my failure plan? What's, what, what's my plan when I fail? When things don't go well, when I do strike out, three or four times in the game when I have a tournament where I get one hit in eight games and I'm pissed off and I'm upset. Like what happens when I don't succeed? Right. And it's really easy for us to have a, a pregame plan, but it's really tough to have a failure plan. So I want to get into that. Like, hey, how do we develop a failure plan? And here's my, just my knowledge on it. And like some things that I've learned about it and you guys can take it wherever you want. But the biggest thing is what's my system to handle my failure? And there's a couple of things that we can do. There's the, the typical, the mental toilet flush, right? Like my reset button. I, I, I picture myself flushing the toilet. I look at my focal point on my bat, which is like a DeMarini sign, the D or the E or whatever symbol on my bat where I take a deep breath and breathe it and breathe it out. But guess what? That doesn't work for everybody. There's the PS4 analogy that I love, my reset button. I'm playing Madden. I'm playing MLB The Show. I'm getting crushed. I'm pissed off. I hit the reset button, it never happened, right? Reset, that game doesn't count. Let's move on to the next one. Or we can, if we strike out, so we strike out on a fastball over our head, and it was a terrible pitch, we swung at it, we can go into the dugout and we can do a couple different things. One, we can, if we sit down in the dugout for a minute, or we stand up and support our teammates, whatever that is for you, we can go through in our mind, seeing myself taking that pitch and then getting a pitch that I like to hit that next one. So my next at bat, I'm more prepared. A lot of the times we see ourselves continuing to swing at that pitch, and then what happens the next at bat? I swing at a ball in the dirt, or I swing at a ball over my head again, or somebody almost hits me and I'm flailing out on it because I'm super upset. But if I see myself visualize, right, I go into my mind and I say, look, let me watch this happen. I'm going to see myself taking that pitch this time, 
and then getting my pitch and putting a good swing on it, at least we're getting ourselves back in our zone and into our approach. So the few things that you can do there, the middle reset button where we can hit reset on the PlayStation, move on, let's get through this. There's, hey, once I cross the line, maybe that's when everything's done and, and I'm good to go and it's back to me, back to what I do best. Maybe it's um, sitting there and visualizing myself having success again to get me back on track. Or maybe it's just blowing it off and put my helmet down and once I take off my batting gloves, it's over with. Like whatever happens, I can think about it. I acknowledge that it happened. I want to know that that happened, right? I can't just put it away. Otherwise, it's going to build up and fester inside of me. I've got to acknowledge that it happened. But if I can put it away, like my batting gloves symbolizes me ripping this off, right? Or I put my glove on and it's like put my protection back on. I'm ready to go. Jake, what do you got on this? And then you guys do a lot of this stuff. You talked about even your locker, like putting it in your locker. What happened before your day? I put it in my locker before I go to the game. That blew me away, dude. I used it today with an athlete one-on-one. I said, hey, look, try this before you go in the cage. Leave it in your room and then go out to the cage and do this. Because he's like, I'm struggling with school. School has been tough. I'm, I'm 18 yep. in high school. I'm trying to get to college. I want to play. But it's tough, man. I don't know what to do. I'm like, look, mentally check that in your room. Leave it in there. When you walk out the back door, it's go time. I'm getting to the cage. That's my hour, my power hour, like to get my work in. So what do you do? What are some recommendations that you would have? Yeah, so we do we do a few things. Number one, um, we have our players develop what we call power phrases, right? So when we talk about a power phrase, that is for you a positive affirmation or phrase that might not mean anything to anybody else, but for you it's essentially that reset button um, to get your mind back on track to move past whatever that negative was. Um, one of the physical ways that we do that that, that Austin was talking about is um, our mental locker. So when we get changed as a team before practice or before games at the high school level, um, every item of clothing that they take off from the school day and they put in their locker, they leave something negative from the day with that. So they'll take off their shirt and they'll say, hey, I'm leaving that, that bad grade on my math test with this. And they just mentally work through that with the goal being that when they walk out of that locker room and, and go to the field, they're solely focused on being present in that moment for practice. Okay, so... Anything that gets you present with where you are is vital. Um, so I think there's a couple big things. One, you need to understand the most important moment of your life is this one. And that will always be true no matter when you say it, right? Because it's the only one I can control. I can't control what happened 10 minutes ago. I can't control what's going to happen in 10 minutes. The only moment that I have any control over is this one right now, right? No matter when you say that, it always rings true. So once you know that, then you start to live the moment that you're in a little bit different because you start to see the value and the urgency behind it. Because why wouldn't you be urgent? If this is the most important moment of your life, why wouldn't you get the most out of it and suck everything you can out of that moment to maximize it, right? So when we do that, we got to look at that fact of that leads me to think like, okay, be present. So be here now, right? So let's think about pressure. When we look at pressure, pressure comes from fear of things that have happened in the past, and it comes from anxiety about things that might happen in the future. So that's past and future. But in the present moment, if we take out past and future, there's no such thing as pressure. It doesn't exist in this moment. It only exists because you're trying to bring in everything from past and future as well. And your brain is all over the place with it. So the more that you can focus on be here, be present right now, it takes away all of the extra stuff outside of that. And it allows you to actually like, focus all of your energy on what you're doing. Okay. One of the analogies we use a lot is, is dishes. Okay. Cause nobody likes doing dishes. I'm the worst at it. Cause here's what I do. Here, here's what I do. We'll see if you do the same thing. I, I have this cup. I'll bring this cup upstairs and I'll put it in the sink and it'll sit there. Cause I'll look at it and think, yeah, that won't take long to wash. I'm not doing it right now. And then suddenly there's 30 cups and all the silverware that we own in the house and all of the plates and that thing is stacked to the roof of all of these dishes, right? So this cup is one thing that doesn't go your way, right? You woke up late, you struck out your first, first step at whatever that was. And rather than dealing with this and saying, man, I struck out, this is where I went wrong in my approach. I'm going to flush that and move to my next step back. Boom, clean. What we do is we take Okay, that was a bad at bat. Now I'm going to throw the ball in this warm up as hard as I can at my first baseman. You overthrow it. So now there's another cup and another cup and another cup. And before we know it, you've stacked all of your problems that actually had nothing to do with each other. 
and you're just in this deep pit of depression of the world is against me and nobody believes in me and I'll never be successful. And you've gone from one little problem to this whole downhill road that you're going down because you couldn't separate, right? So we need to make sure that we don't correlate things that aren't actually related to each other. Deal with one problem when you have it, right? Separate that, have that power phrase, okay? And one thing that, that really helps with power phrases for me is I write them down and I put them in places that I see. Um, we got some guys that go to the high school, Matt. If you go to my desk, it looks like somebody threw up post-it notes because it's all over, right? Rising tide lifts all ships. We got that up there. Be where your feet are. Like we got 30 to 40 phrases that I know in my mind, like when I'm struggling with something, I can go back to those. So the more that you know that and you, you feed yourself that knowledge of the things that you know will help you overcome, um, the better off you'll be. Okay. But again, that's an everyday thing. That's the ability to overcome outside of baseball as well and not stack everything in your life. Because most people in general continue to stack. Many adults that are in our lives, in our professions, continue to stack. And then that comes out on you guys. So sometimes it's hard to find a really good reference for that. But I, if I had to say one thing, it's that just separate everything, live in the present moment. And that takes out a lot of the fear and anxiety that you would have when you start thinking about past or future. It's huge, man. It's absolutely huge. I love the analogy of the the, uh, the dishes too, because I can't stand the dishes. No, I get worse. It's the worst. It's the worst. <laughs> it's the worst, no matter how old you are. Whether you're eight years old and mom tells you to do the dishes or clean up your your plate, or you're 25, 27, 30 years old, and you got to actually do the dishes yourself. Um, I put in some in the chat there, just some different um, I am phrases, and the, the what we mean by the power phrase is something that I am, like something that you define yourself by. Like we talk a lot about identity, and it's all about who do I define myself, not coach, not coach Adam or coach Jake or coach Ronnie. Like who do I say I am? Do I say I'm powerful? For me, I say I, every day I am fearless and I am powerful because when I get on stage to speak in front of five kids or 500 kids. I'm nervous either way. I'm always going to be nervous. But if I continue to tell myself I'm fearless and I'm powerful, I can do anything I set my mind to if I believe it. But it's so easy for us to believe the opposite, that we're not good enough, that we don't belong on the field, that we shouldn't be there. And then that just hurts us in our performance. It hurts us in our personal life. It hurts us in our gratitude, our love, our passion, and it pulls us down. Um, Ronnie, what else do you got on the subject? Yeah, just for me, I got one big thing, and this is what I'm learning from or listening to you guys is, always link everything to positivity there yeah. are so many negatives that happen in this game i mean think about it it literally is called the game of failure you're going to fail way more than you're going to succeed our goal in the game is to link everything to positivity right you make an error fine i'm going to go and get a hit right you struck out your first at bat perfect i'm going to lay a bunt down my next at bat and get a guy over you have to link everything to positivity you have a bad day next day's the tomorrow's going to be the best day of my whole life that's my biggest takeaway from everything I heard from Austin, everything I heard from Jake. To, to sum it up for you guys, positivity, man. There, like I said, like, you can always find a negative in baseball. I don't throw far enough. I don't throw hard enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't hit it that far. You can always find that. That's the easiest thing in the world. But when all of those things are kind of going down for you, can you find the positive in it? Find what you're good at. You know what I mean? I think that that's huge. So finding positivity – Having that, having that positive word to tell yourself those, those things that are going to help you guys, I think is big, right? When you step in the batter's box, I am the best baseball player in the entire world, right? I am going to get a hit. I am going to help my team, right? That's, that's the thing that I want you guys to take away from it is positivity always, no matter what's happening, right? Yep. And um, Chase Wells in here, one of my buddy's cousins, uh, played with uh, this guy, Tyler Wells in college, and his cousin's in here from a small town in, in Northern California, and He's, uh, I believe, senior in high school, correct, Chase? You can put it in the chat. Um, I only have it on private right now, but I believe he's senior in high school, um, trying to get to the next level, maybe a junior, sorry. And um, he put something in there. He's like, it's really hard for me to fail because it's, it's tough. You know, it's tough to handle the failure, but what makes it easier is having people around me that care about me. Yes. I love hearing that, dude. Yeah. Like my parents and my family and my coaches that care about him. And his coach is ironically his cousin, Tyler, which is awesome because – Tyler's the man. I love Tyler. But um, just to be able to hear that, like, hey, if we got people around us that support us and care about us, and the coaches in here, for the most part, are working with the majority of the athletes in here. So we care about our athletes a lot. That's why we invited them here, because we want to give them as much value. I want to expose my guys and girls to you guys. And same vice versa, I'm sure. So we want to inspire each other. So that, that's big time. Man. I love that. Um, Adam, do you got anything to add to that before we wrap up? 
Yeah, uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of homework uh, for this. Is uh, uh, Byler was talking about developing that approach to failure and how you're going to handle it when it comes. And I want you to think about what is your gut reaction or your immediate reaction when there is a failure in your life, whether that is you took a fastball right down the middle or a ball or a, a ball was co- called a call to strike that shouldn't have been or some, just something bad happens. What is your immediate reaction? What is your body language like? When that right right after that, what is your what does the look on your face say you feel about it when that happens? And I want you guys to work on having a, an approach of if your body language and the way that you feel and the way that you act is extremely negative, of working towards that positive talk, those positive words and that positivity that Ronnie was talking about, and using these power phrases to lift you out of that. And don't look around at everybody else for somebody to blame when that problem arises. Look at yourself and think about what was my approach to this problem before it before it happened, and is there something that I could have done to eliminate the issue? When uh, Coach Jake and I coach together, it's immediately after a loss or after a win, we're immediately looking at each other going, what can we do as coaches to make these kids better? We don't blame it on uh, this kid had a horrible outing on the mound. We look at ourselves. We try to handle that failure internally and figure out what can we do immediately to try to make this thing better and handle this in a different light. So for you guys, start developing that failure approach by thinking about when failure happens, was I expecting something bad to happen? And right after it happens, what is my immediate reaction? Because your immediate reaction usually tells us whether or not you were prepared for it or not. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, it's huge. It's huge. It's credit to what you have created too with your program. You know, so just having that. Um, Stop it. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Somebody's getting their cookies yeah. taken or something, man. Somebody get their hand cookie Whoa. jar. Um, I apologize. I remember me and my brother did the same thing. Um, but no, just having those plans, right? Like I challenge you guys to have a plan. Um, and, and do what you need to do to be successful and like create a plan for yourself, a pre-game plan and a post-game plan. It's, it's, it's simple, but it's challenging to do. And then to end and wrap up, please like send us whatever notes you have, like tag us in them on social media, send them to us privately, whatever it is. We want to see where you guys are improving, what, what's really sticking with you so that we know going forward what we can work on and some things that um, we want to help you become more successful. So send it to us, tag us on social media. We're putting it in the chat, the dugout coalition, hot corner athletics in bam fan, uh, major league university tag us in it. We want to see this so that we can one repost it. So your friends, your teammates and the other people around you can see this. And then two, so we can help make this baseball community and softball community a better place because that's the ultimate goal with this is how can we inspire more athletes? So go inspire your friends, inspire your teammates, tell them to get in here. Tell them, Hey, I've been learning so much. Look at my notes, dude. I'm freaking learning. Like this is awesome. Come in here and, and get better with me. Let's get better during this time. Let's not go out and wait till the summer where we're, we didn't do anything for the next three weeks, four weeks. And then we go out to summer and we suck. And we're sad because we're having bad results and we don't know what's going on and we're chasing them. Like, let's flip the script, right? Let's flip the script and let's get better at something every single day. And this is one way that you can get a lot better and continue to improve your career. So um, thank you guys for tuning on here again. We'll be back at 1 p.m. tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, please, like I said, send us your notes, tag us in your notes, ask us questions. If you have questions, DM us, Dugout Coalition, any of our brands you can hit us up on. We're here to help you. We want to make the world a better place. We want to help you become one step closer to your dream, whether that's playing in high school, college, professionally, whatever that looks like for you guys. I don't know if you have anything else to wrap up before we leave, but that's what I've got. I got, I got one thing I want you guys to think about, and I'm, I promise there's a point, but I'm not going to give you that point until tomorrow. All right, a few of you that I have at the high school level know this, so don't put it in the chat, but I want you to think about this question. If you woke up and you had $86,400 in your personal bank, like your own account, but the only rules were at the end of that day when you went to bed, that money was gone. You couldn't save it. It just went away. Okay, what would you do with that money? Okay, because the next day when you wake up, there's another $86,400, okay? So every day you get $86,400, but you can't save it, all right? So what are you gonna, I, I wanna hear some good ones tomorrow when we start, like what are you gonna buy with your $86,400 each day? Like what, what are the things that are on your list? How are you gonna use that money 
Okay, and I promise there's a point. We'll talk through it tomorrow of what that actually relates to. But I'm curious to see what you guys have. That's a good amount of money for somebody your age. So we'll see what you come up with. I like that. I like it a lot. Um, thank you, guys. Have a great day. Enjoy it. Like I said, tag us. Encourage each other. We're here to help you. Peace. See you, hey guys. Peace. Hey, boys and girls and team. I can't bank to put it in, my dude.